Hi, Filmatics. Welcome back to part two with Barry Cook, animation director known for Director of Milan and amazing um, other Disney shows like Tron, doing special effects for Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and so many more. We'll find out um, what other films he produced, direct, directed, and uh, let's welcome Barry Cook back to the show. Welcome, Barry. Hi, thank you. Yeah, we were having so much fun on the part one with you talking about how you uh, grew up in uh, Tennessee, moved to Florida, your dad was a, um, a fine art painter, and how you got your internship at Hanna-Barbera, and then got this amazing gig at Disney, which ended up where you got to direct Mulan. That is an amazing journey to getting into the business. <laughs> Well, thanks. And a lot of people always ask, uh, how do I get into the film industry or how do I get into animation or how do I, and no, nobody, I don't know of anyone I've talked to whose path has been the same. I mean, Disney recruited heavily from certain colleges like CalArts and, and which Disney, Walt Disney originally founded that school, uh, CalArts in California and, uh, and other schools like Ringling School of Art here in Florida and Sarasota and Columbus College of Art and Design uh, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, RISD, which in Rhode Island, uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, some of the top, you know, art schools in the United States. Uh, a, maybe a lot of people have gotten into the film industry through those schools, but uh, my path was very indirect and, and very unorthodox, and uh, it was just a strange thing, you know, because I did not have a college degree coming into Disney, and yet I ended up directing one of their features. So that was very, very strange. Yeah. So, how, so what happens after you direct a feature at Disney? Do they I'll let you um, direct others, or is it just like you always are trying to get the next gig, or how does it kind of flow? Well, uh, I, I began developing some ideas for another feature, and uh, and then I got really deep into a feature film I was developing. But then, uh, as we were in the middle of developing it, uh, 9/11 happened in 2001, and. Uh, I don't know if you recall the business climate at the time, but many, many companies just began sort of retracting and contracting. And, and also too, we were on the cusp of going from 2D animation into CG animation. And again, the film I wanted to make, uh, I think it's known by most people in the animation industry by the title of My Peoples. It was also called A Few Good Ghosts. That was one of the working titles. Um, and, uh, and it had also a hybrid of 2D and CG characters in it, you know, just an art form that I experimented with early on and wanted to continue something on a bigger scale. And a lot of that story, uh, the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, had just come out. And this sort of awareness of bluegrass and roots music, Americana music, uh, Hollywood finally sort of like, what is this? Because when Oh Brother, Where Art Thou came out, it became the biggest selling movie soundtrack of the whole year and it's probably among the biggest selling movie soundtracks ever recorded uh the music of it so uh i attempted to get that film off the ground but then uh, the studio in florida closed and uh disney's closed their studio in australia television studio they closed their studio in japan and they still closed their studio in paris and uh, I had been offered the opportunity perhaps to go to other studios in Southern California. Uh, there was some opportunity at Sony at the time, they were looking for directors and um, DreamWorks, but I just decided that I was gonna stay in Florida and just go sort of independent and go rogue. And when I did that, and I just became an independent contractor and then I formed my own company, Studio PB&J, and the PB and J, it's like the sandwich, right? My 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 first initial of my name and the first initial of my name of my two sons, so it's Peter, Barry, and Joe. Uh, and Joe helps me actually sometimes with some business stuff. He's a sort of a marketing guy that helps me do things. And uh, and Pete uh, works for an advertising agency uh, up in Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, he gives me a lot of good advice, uh, you know, and. Uh, 
and because he's in that uh, he's a he's a create he he uh, oversees a creative department for a big ad agency. So so I have kids that are sort of you know does my dream that it could be sort of the the pop and son sort of business someday you know but um, but I just became independent and became an independent contractor and then I could I was free to work on films like Arthur Christmas with with Ardman Studios and uh, in England. And, uh, and then uh, after that, I worked with BBC Earth and uh, uh, 20th Century Fox on Walking with Dinosaurs, a 3D movie that they were doing. It was more for pretty young kids, but and sort of educational about dinosaurs and stuff like that. But worked in Sydney, Australia for a year at Animal Logic Studios, which is one of the premier visual effects uh, creature animation studios in the world just amazing talent down there and to spend a year down there and those are opportunities that you know if i'd stayed at disney it might not have gotten but i worked uh i worked on uh, one film that's actually still being animated now as a producer uh, i'm not sure what the title of it is the last title was kong the beginning k-o-n-g it wasn't king kong it was the monkey king kong and the monkey king is an old chinese legend and uh and over the years, I've been approached by many producers from China because they they called me and they've said, you're the only American director who's ever told a Chinese story well. So could you help us with our Chinese story? So I've gone in and done a lot of script consultation on various film projects and various animation projects uh, in in China uh, over the year, over the you know past 10 or 15 years also. So um but anyway that's uh and then also too for me now it's like i really i've worked on everybody else's movies for a long time and i just want to start creating some of my own content and building some of my own content and writing a lot of i'm doing a lot of writing now and a lot of uh writing screenplays and ideas for for films and so forth and how does like an independent animation, um, how, how does that, like you just produce the movie and like how easy is it to get distribution? Would it be just streaming distribution or like what is the path for independent animation? Well, it's changed drastically. I mean, distribution, anybody who's in the film industry, especially independent filmmakers. And it's funny because my first days going to the film festival at Vanderbilt University, the Sinking Creek in Nashville, you know, everybody I met was an independent filmmaker. And it's sort of like, that's what I want to be. I want to be an independent filmmaker. I want to make my own films. Well, nobody told me how expensive making films would be. But uh, but uh, you can make films. But getting, getting distribution is near impossible. And now everybody's making films. Like back in the 90s, there, uh, 1990s, there was a, a surge of independent filmmakers who sort of hit the big time making you know things like mariachi and th these these different these different movies that even blair witch project and things like this are just sort of came, like low budget things but really hit you know but you have to realize those are sort of like uh winning the lottery sort of experiences for a lot of those uh, el, Mar el, Mar el mariachi uh uh like that film was you know Two hundred thousand dollar budget, and you know, ended up making millions. So a lot of a lot of different independent filmmakers, and then you could get distribution. And nowadays, you can still get distribution, but or you find maybe find distribution on uh, streaming one of the streaming services. But again, going back to when I was a kid, I was the only kid in high school making movies. Now you go to any high school, there's a lot of movie makers. Because we can do it with our phones and we can do 4K with our phones and we can do we can put a gimbal on our phones and we can do steady cam shots and we can do anything we want. And the animation tools like the Un Unreal Engine, which is a CG uh, tool, it's open to the public. It's free. You can use it. Anybody can use it, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a plethora. There's just a multitude of filmmakers making films today. So. The marketplace is like super saturated and super crowded and uh, the actual value of a film uh, 
what a filmmaker can make off of an independent film has gone down and down and down and down. So it's really hard. I think uh, I've been listening for the last couple of years to um, a uh, YouTube caster named Alex Ferrari. I'll give him a little plug because he has an uh, indie film Hustle. But he's also written some books, but he talks about you know, how independent filmmakers, filmmakers today, they really have to cultivate their audience, their niche audience to find the right audience for their film and connect on social media and find the audience. You just can't get wide distribution and independent animation where your question started, you know, budgets for those were ranged from the lowest budgets, you know, around $20 million for a film to maybe upwards of $80 million nowadays. And it's like, if you're getting that kind of investment in that kind of film, that's a very risky place to be in right now. Uh, because you really can't compete with Disney and you can't compete with Pixar and, or Illumination. You don't have the marketing strength and you don't have the the audience awareness. Well, what the audience are aware of is they're just completely immersed in very high quality imagery and animation on the screen. And if anything even smells slightly cheap, they just turn away from it. Well, I can see better animation than this for free on Disney+. Plus. Why would I want to watch this independent film over on some other streaming platform? Or why would I want to pay $10 when I can get a month's long subscription, you know, for, for, for $11. So it's, it's become very, very difficult, I think for independent filmmakers to, to, uh, to eke out a living. Uh, but uh, that's just the nature of the business right now, ever changing daily. The, the way things are changing. And I don't, and I don't, uh, I've never fancied myself as a business person, you know, it's show business, but I'm sort of in the show part. I'm the, you know, creating the content and not selling the content really is, has been my bag. Usually somebody else has the job of selling it. Yeah. So what's on the horizon for you? Like, um, any, can you tell us what you're working on? Any fun stories, anything exciting that we, you can like give us a little sneak peek into? Well, yeah, a little bit. Uh, I was writing a, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to start writing some of my own stories, and I've been doing that for the last few years. And um, I've always been very partial to ghost stories. And my first movie I made when I was 10 was Dickens' Christmas Carol, including Marley's Ghost. There's four ghosts in that story. The film that I didn't get to make at Disney, but I wanted to make, one of the working titles, as I mentioned, was A Few Good Ghosts. Uh, so I've always been sort of intrigued by ghost stories, and part of that came up from growing up where I did in Tennessee and my mom's side of the family and sort of country folk, you know, back there. And they had all these great ghost stories and, you know, interesting sort of paranormal tales and supernatural tales. And so I began writing, I thought, I'm going to write a very contained story, a ghost story it takes place sort of like a horror movie all in one house. And I called it the happy place, which is sort of, named after the house but i i started i just wrote it as a short story originally and then the pandemic you know came along and uh i by that time i think i'd written it as a, a full-length screenplay and uh so i said you know what can i do how can i get this thing out there and make it happen so i rewrote it as an audio drama as an audio play and over the last two years, we've been recording it in Nashville with some local actors there, nobody famous. And uh, we've got it all recorded. It's going to the final mix next week. So I'm not sure what platform it's going to be on. Maybe Audible. I know I'll probably uh, put a chapter at a time on my YouTube channel, which is Studio PB&J, which I don't really post there a lot. But starting with this audio play, I'll start doing regular posts and we've got some behind the scenes footage that we've uh, posted up there already. And, and one clip from the audio play, I think is up there now. Um, and then also I said, well, I'll just also publish as a book. So what I have here in my hand, which nobody can see, but you can see it. Uh, I got the first proof copy of the book version of the happy place. Oh, wow. And, uh, so this just went live on Amazon today. The um, Happy Place by I, Barry Cook. And now is it, uh, 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 what kind of ghost story is it? Is it like um, a family friendly or like more like what level ghost story can you compare it to? Like the Watcher kind of thing or? 
Uh, no, this is my kind of ghost story. I don't know if it's like anything else. But is it like it's family, a, it's, more family, like friendly, or is it more Halloweenish? No, it, it's got some. It's got. Uh, it's got some. Uh, you know, it's got some adult themes in it, murder <laughs> and uh, stuff like that. But uh, it's ba it's the story of a young musician, and the story is set in 1969. And he's a young musician. He's hitchhiking from uh, uh, from Mississippi on his way to Woodstock, the music festival in New York. <laughs> and when he gets to Nashville, he meets someone in that Na uh, near Nashville, a small town, and uh, and he's murdered. And he gets stuck in his killer's house as a ghost. Oh. So that's the basic story. So it's set Ooh. in 1969. It's called The Happy Place, uh, a ghost story from the summer of 1969. And a lot of it's based on some childhood memories. A lot of it's based on the house that the old farmhouse that my parents used to live in is sort of the setting for the story, the main setting for the story. And it's just a novella. It's, you know, 110 pages or something. Just a small book, ah. you know, five by eight paperback. And uh, so, yeah, it went live today. I think there's like a little 72 hour turnaround, but by Halloween, it should be available for purchase on Amazon. You should be able to find it. I got to put this on ghostly stories and strange things. So maybe uh, <laughs> that was like one of my new podcasts because I'm so, I think everyone's like obsessed with ghosts ghosts like this watcher that's out like with the mysterious yeah. you know letters and stuff and just we just can't get enough of this you know on any any house that someone lived in and had to move out because of the the, the craziness that went inside that's unexplained right. supposedly <laughs> yeah you know people love that and they love making tv shows around that so congratulations because books are really hard to do and that looks like a beautiful book you did that self-published on amazon or yeah this is self-published on amazon uh and uh, it looks professional, know, it, it, like a professional publisher, like like a big publisher did it. Well, you know, I did the cover illustration. And there you and, go. Uh, and you know, they do a good job. I um, this is my proof copy. It's still marked up with a few changes I want to make. The nice thing about self publishing something like this is that um, you know it's print on demand, so they don't print like a thousand copies and you're stuck with them in your garage if you can't sell them. They're if somebody orders one, they print one. They send it to them right overnight. They just—that's the way Amazon. They got a lot of their facilities have printing facilities inside, and um, so even if I wanted to uh, modify some of the content or the cover in any way, or put new blurbs on the back of the cover, or whatever I want to do, you can change content anytime. And, and next time somebody orders it, it'll be an updated copy. You know, if you change more than 20% of the book, then you have to do a second edition or something like that. But I think I'll still be, you know, I'm just always in, you know, looking for little tweaks and looking for little, you know, minor little things that I think, oh, maybe that word could be a little better. So it might, you know, it might uh, evolve even a little more uh, over the next few weeks. But uh, we're pretty much done with uh, the book and uh it's going to be out there and then uh and then it's really just spending maybe the next year and trying to drive traffic toward that you know and trying to find people who are interested and like you said you have you know a podcast that features you know ghost stories and paranormal you know finding those people who are interested in that stuff and, and pointing them in the direction they could get it uh so yeah that could be great and uh and the audio drama is really fun, and it's basically like a movie with no picture. I mean, it's a full soundtrack, music, sort of 60s style Hendrix guitar stuff in there, and all sorts of great stuff. Uh, and it's got a lot of music. It's got two two songs in it, one original song uh, that's in there, and uh, one uh, old blues song that's in there. And uh, so it's really full of music and sound effects, and it just, you know, you can just watch it and... Uh, oh, do we get a sneak story. peek? Do we get a, Do we get to listen to any of that music? Do um, are you? Can you I don't have it? any of it right at hand. But, oh uh, man, we would love to hear some, like a little sneak yeah, peek. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's fun because it's sort of. I just tried to get that that vibe of 1969, and that was a very interesting year. Uh, if as you know, I probably a lot of your listeners wouldn't recall, but 69 is the year 
first year of the first moon landing. And it was also the year of the Manson murders, you know, where Charles, Charles Manson murdered uh, Sharon Tate and the people in that household. So it was a very strange year. It was also this the August. It, it all happened in July and August of 69. And the Woodstock, was all, the Woodstock Music Festival was also in August of that year. So it was an amazing point in, uh, in the sort of cultural history of America. And, uh, and I grew up, I was only 10 years old in 1969, but, uh, but just everything resonated with me and I've always wanted to write about it a bit. So I find a, it's a fictional story that I've written, but it's, uh, it's just everything I, I knew and know about that period of time uh, to sort of pack it into the story and, and make it feel really authentic to the time that it's set in. Yeah, and um, are your executive producing a couple things too? Do you want to? Can you share anything with some of these things that you're coming up that you're executive producing? It sounds interesting. Like, uh, well, the one I mentioned was the uh, Kong: The Beginning. Uh, yeah. It's being animated. Uh, it's being animated at a studio called Monk in uh, in Bangkok, Thailand. I was wow. down there uh, summer before last to uh, get those guys kicked off. I don't think they're quite finished with the film yet. I really don't have any real connection with the film anymore. I was in the early days of development and uh, and scripting and and getting the movie up on its feet, so to speak. But now it's been handed over for production, and so I'm not really involved in it. Hopefully, it will come out in the near future. I think it's going to be a big release in China because it is a Chinese production. Oh, so I think it'll be a big. It'll, but I'm, I'm an executive producer of that film. Uh, but uh, other than that, just producing things like this audio podcast. I am working with another film that I can't mention right now. It's a, it's a very, it would be a big release feature film. Uh, and I wrote the screenplay for it. And, uh, and, and I'm continuing on as story uh, and script consultant through the pre-production process. So we're, we're in, in the middle of pre-production right now on that project. Uh, I can't really say much about it yet, but uh, but that's that's what's keep, it's keeping me really busy right now. At least half of my week I spend on that working on that film. I, I see, like the um, the Cleo, the Pharaoh, and Mean Margaret. Are you allowed to share anything with those, or they're still early? Uh, mean Margaret is a is a film that I developed uh, more than ten years ago. Uh, there was a startup studio in Burbank called IDT, and uh, it was later sold to Stars. And uh, we had developed this film, Mean Margaret, which was based on a children's book by Tor Seidler, a uh, great children's book, and a very popular children's book. Um, and uh, I developed basically the animated feature film version of that. Uh, Chris Henderson uh, is now the producer of it, and he's picked it up from stars. And we, you know, I can't say much about that film either, but that's been out there sort of in the press. But I think we're this close to uh, starting a pre-production track on it, but I can't say that, you know, it's like everything. You can't count your chickens in Hollywood. You just can't. And uh, what was the other one you had mentioned? The Pharaoh. The, um... Oh, Cleo, Last Pharaoh. Yeah, a good friend of mine, Lori Ashford, that I worked with uh, at Disney. Uh, she has a company called L.A. Story, which is sounds like Los Angeles Story, but it's Lori Ashburn Story, L.A. Story. She, she lives in Los Angeles now, but... Uh, uh, she she has writ, had written a screenplay about Cleopatra, uh, the last Pharaoh Cleopatra, and it's a family type film uh, set in Egypt and set in Alexandria, Egypt. And uh, I worked with her. Uh, I've worked with her over the past couple of years, just helping perfect the screenplay and and helping her get the story as good as it can be. I think there are some distributors and some uh people interested in making it happen but right now it's uh you know sort of on a side burner for me at least i think Lori's pressing along with it her company la story she does a lot of uh script consulting herself and she does uh a lot of uh i guess like what you would call script coverage for screenwriters so that's, you know, taking a script and then doing coverage. And she may do coverage for other studios as well. So she's a, she's a, you know, 
she does a lot of script coverage and she's creating a lot of original her own original content and doing some things now so it's fun to be involved with some folks that i worked you know shoulder to shoulder with while i was at disney but now we're all sort of out and independent and uh trying to find our way and trying to find new ways to do things and um uh, and getting sort of hooked back up with people that i've worked with in the past has been really fun and uh and so that's a uh, yeah, that's a, a really fun story, and I hope that uh, they can we can get it made. Yeah. Um, do you want to share anything, like any fun stories on Little Mermaid or Aladdin real quickly that you – any any? any yeah, well, memories? I was just – you know, after Tron, I started working in the visual effects department and uh, uh, effects animation department for Disney feature animation, and, um, and then uh, – visual effects for hand-drawn animation with things like lightning waves and little mermaid bubbles i tell everybody i did not draw every bubble in the little mermaid or i did not animate every bubble in the little mermaid i only animated about two billion of them so so for yeah for basically a year i'm just doing bubbles behind characters you know stuff like that and uh and uh, Beauty and, uh, Aladdin was the last feature I worked on as an effects animator and supervisor of an effects department here in Florida, of the effects department in Florida. But then I started directing short films after that. So, uh, but yeah, just anything that's uh, not a character that needs to move or needs to be on the screen, any visual effect, rain, sleet, snow, water, waves, shadows, explosions, you name it, we drew it and animated <laughs> That's amazing. So you write, you do special effects, you direct, you produce, you executive produce. You have so many, and you have a book out called The Happy Place, which is more of a ghost story. And um, so just so many great things. So do you have social media where they can keep up with you or a website where um, your fans can um, see what you're up to? Well, because we were doing this book and self-publishing this book and doing this audio uh, audio play of The Happy Place, we have established Studio PB and Studio PBJ.com. There's not really a lot of content up there right now, but that's where we're going to be, you know, letting folks know what's happening. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel, Studio PBJ.com, or Studio PB and J uh, on YouTube. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so I don't do, but really, I don't, that's, you know, you know, it's, it's a full time job, social media. And if you're and, writing and uh, creating, like, um, yeah, writing and creating, and, and if you're writing stories, people don't understand, like, how long it can take to write a story. It takes a long time. And to, to come up with a good story. And, you know, my kids' podcast, Enchanting Book Reading, like, I'm, like, putting these stories out as fast as I can. And I think, I, like you said, when you write, writing is writing. And I think it's made me a faster writer and a better writer when, um, the kids are listening. Cause it's ranked top one. Well, one more thing. Speaking yeah. of kids, I do have the next project, the next yeah. book project. I've already started on it. I've been working on it actually for a couple of years when I can, it's called the gumdrop ghost. It's also a ghost story, but oh. it's for kids. It's just a little picture book, but I'm illustrating it. I wrote it and I'm illustrating it. So my goal is to have that available by next Halloween. So my goal right now is just something I want to do going into my retirement years. I want to do a little book every year. I've got a, a graphic novel based on a screenplay that I wrote called The Cat and the Fiddle. And uh, that would be more of a family-oriented story probably. And, uh, and that's a bit much bigger project, but I've been working on that for several years. So I've got this sort of track that I'm – basically a track I'm trying to get on to release some sort of publication, a book. Uh, every year, uh, once a year. So and uh, and so that's that's sort of my goal. You know, I don't know how it all turn out. A lot of times you get distracted by other film projects, and somebody hires you to do something, and you get tied up, and you don't have enough time for your own stuff. But I'm trying to focus as much attention as I can on my own stuff right now, just because I've always wanted to do it, and I know that you know, eventually there'll come a time when I can't do it. So it's like I want to try to do stuff now while I'm still capable and still interested and still creative. Yeah, well, it's been amazing having you on the show. Thank you so much. And everyone take a second to hit the um, download the podcast. If you'd like to support us, buy me coffee sneakies or PayPal anonymous content and check out our YouTube channel, uh, Story Pals and our other podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you, Barry.
Thank you.